had an incident and uh, HSE came into the department uh, and the, the inspector basically met with the physicist beforehand and the, uh, the, the radiographers and said, um, we're going to start this off by asking the managers right, how they manage radiation safety. Okay? And when I ask the question, I want everybody but the manager who wasn't there to keep really, really quiet. Okay? So we all sat down and we did the pleasantries and you know, we're really sorry, all of that. And he said to the, uh, who was a clinical director, who was a radiologist, and he said, uh, so, so could you tell us how you manage uh, radiation safety in your department? Now everybody knows that he probably never thought about it until he'd had the incident, okay? So he started digging himself a hole and started, well, well we, um, we, we, we do all these things, and he sort of looks around the room at all his colleagues saying, help me, help me, I don't know any of this stuff, do you know what I mean? Uh, so that was that, and he dug himself into a hole, and eventually the, uh, the inspector sort of let him off the hook and, and, and moved on, you see. So after about an hour, we all had a, a quick comfort break, and we met the chap in the toilet, and we're sort of standing there at the arrival, right? <laughs> and he said, do you know, he said, that's the best fun I've had in ages. <laughs> right, so keep calm, it's only a, a CQC uh, inspection. What I would suggest to you is, you've heard about the... Um, about the Spanish Inquisition, so they all turned up with their coats, coats and no one expects the Spanish Inquisition. You, you've got to be ready, there's, there's just no way around it these days. You have to be ready for the inspection. So I, I would suggest to you that you get confident that if they turned up tomorrow, you could deal with it. Okay? That's, that's the, the place that you need to be at. They're not unreasonable, okay? you know, no need to panic if you're prepared and you've done what you're supposed to do. And hopefully by the end of today, you will know what you're supposed to do uh, and have an action plan to deal with that, okay? So hopefully, keep calm, it's only a, a CQC inspection. Right, anybody seen the sixth sense? Yeah. Okay, who has a problem with referrers? <laughs> Come on, let's have a show of hands. Come on. <coughs> yeah, okay. So this is what my uh, radiographers sort of think about it. I see stupid people, they're everywhere. They walk around like everybody else, they don't even know they're dumb. Okay? So, I mean, I'm joking. We, we, we do actually have in the department, there's a sign on the wall for the different requests. So there's, there's uh, you know, <coughs> impatience and urgence, and then there's the GP request. But it doesn't say GP request. It says, bus loads of folk, we're now wrong with them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you've got to deal with referrers. That, that's pretty essential. So what does the law say? Uh, the law says that you shall establish recommendations requiring referring criteria for medicals will include radiation doses, and, and ensure that these are available to the referrer. So basically, you've got to educate them in some way, okay? You've got to give them some information. Most people use iRefer for referral guidelines, but what about the specials, okay? It doesn't cover everything, and it doesn't cover everything in sufficient detail, I would suggest to you, because practice is, is evolving, and you might be a particularly specialist centre, you might do something unusual. None of that's wrong, but you need to deal with it. So, for example, nuclear medicine, perhaps cardiology, uh, for, for DEXA, you might have un unusual referrals. Um, so, so you need to think about those areas, and I would suggest that most departments will probably need some deviation from, from eye referrings in some respect, or, or at least you know, additional information to refer. So you might need additional local guidelines. Um, you want to include in that information details of your processes, their responsibilities, and something about dose and risk. So, so, you know, keep it relatively short. You need to tell them what their responsibilities are. You need to tell them what your referral guidelines are. And, and it can be relatively straightforward to do that. Um, where they can find the information about dose and risk. The, the purpose of this is that you want to get high quality requests, okay? And you don't want to get, you know, poor quality requests or, or unnecessary requests. Okay, so you, that's your chance to provide them with some information. Um, there's no legal requirement to train them. Uh, but it's a really good idea. What we do in, in our particular trust is we have an online training package. Okay, so first of all, it started with the new intake. Um, they call, I don't know they call it in every they call it the killing fields. You know when the new junior doctors start uh, when the death rate goes up. Anyway, um, so so we have an online training package. And that's great because we can send it out to them before they actually start. Okay, it's really really quick and simple. It's not rocket science. They have a few questions to answer, and if they pass, we basically allow them to, to use the e-referral system. 
uh, we're about to go to 100% uh, e-referral. There will be no paper. Okay. So it's a really good idea to train them. It's not a legal requirement. If you're going to do it, keep it simple. We certainly make sure all the non-medical referrers complete the package. Basically, if they don't do the package, they never get on the e-request system. Okay, and that's a really good way of, of dealing with it. Okay. Um, it was mentioned about the challenges with, uh, with e-requesting. Um, there is a document produced by the uh, RCR called Guidelines for Ele Electronic Remote Requesting. Get that document out, and every time you implement a new e-referral system, okay, you need to make sure that you've covered all the points in it. Okay, so it covers things like who can access the system, which GP can the receptionist access it. It makes sure that the interface works between the two, so if somebody needs to test that when they request a chest x-ray, there isn't a translation to a chest CT, for example. Okay, it checks any alerts that they have in the system. So you might have an alert to say, well, actually, this chest x-ray was requested yesterday. Do you really need another one? Okay, what are the timings on all of that? So you go through that document, and I, 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 in, in my trust, I converted it to a table, so I've got a checklist. Whenever they mention new e-request system, I send the document in and say, stick all of this on your risk register. Okay, because the IT people always have a risk register, and you just send them the document and say, deal with that. Okay, really, really simple, but it's quite effective. Um, E-request systems have an amazing propensity to, to screw things up. You'd be surprised what, what actually happens with them. Okay. So, referrers, what you need to do. Who are your referrers? Okay. So, whenever you ask people, if, oh, yes, yes, the doctor's in the hospital, we've got a few non-medical referrers, and then you say, anybody outside? Oh, yeah, there's a, a podiatrist. Anybody else? Oh, yes, we've got a few nurses in GP. You know, where is your list of, of referrers? You need to know who all these people actually are. Keep a list so that when you, when you make any changes to practice that you, can, uh, that you can consider, you know, their process. Okay? So you need to think about that. So internally you might have doctors, dentists, allied health professionals. Uh, externally you might have the same. Uh, has anybody got anybody that's not on that list? Any weird and wonderfuls out there? What was that, sorry? Football club doctors. Football club doctors, okay. Mm. Okay. I bet you're quite keen to have them, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> I recommend a thorough thigh examination. <laughs> okay. Matt, can I just check about um, forensic radiography in terms of drug smugglers? I understand what well, the law in Scotland is that the procurator fiscal can request an x ray, but he isn't the referrer. It's usually the medical person that comes to work. <coughs> so, in terms of customs and excise? I have absolutely no idea. Okay. Um, we're in Nottingham, so that's about as far as you can get from any point. So, I, can, but, uh, I have no idea, I'm afraid. I've put it into the new guidance yep. document, so don't worry. Okay. You'll get an answer. Put me in the back. Yeah, I mean, nurses can be a big group, and certainly in our trust, there's a big push to get these people referring because you avoid the situation where um, essentially the, the, you know, the nurse fills in the bit of paper, trundles along to a doctor who's never seen the patient, do you know what I mean, and just does the signature bit, which is really, really hopeless, isn't it? You know, if the nurses really know, then, then they're probably the best person to request. Sorry to interrupt, does no one have chiropractors referring to osteopaths? Osteopaths, we have an osteopath, yeah. Okay. So, so basically, as long as they're registered healthcare professionals and they're on your list of people that you've decided in your organisation that can refer, that's fine. We have a couple of um, cardiac techs mm -hmm. and they aren't actually, don't have to have a registration. Mm -hmm. So they can't refer, they can, can they? Refer. But they, they, under local agreement, we've got them as referrers, is that? No, I think that's it. Yeah. Personally, yeah. that's illegal. Yeah. 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 I think, I personally, I think that's illegal. It is. It is. I mean, it's under extremely strict guidelines, but you know, device and post device. The, the legislation is quite clear. Mm -hmm. It must be a registered healthcare professional. Okay, so we, we used to have them, and then we took them off in 2006, but none changed. Well, we, we do. We, I can't remember the last time actually did refer because we changed our system so the radio provides the request at the time of implantation so okay so that you know but we need to just yeah, they should be off the list. And, and basically, the way we handle it is, the way we handle it in our trust is, ICT will not put anybody 
onto the referrers, uh, e-referral system unless you're a registered healthcare professional. That's a great way to, to track them. Okay? I promise that wasn't a plan. Like a plan. Okay, so the other issue we have is, is nuclear medicine uh, nuclear medicine techs. Um, there is an interesting issue with those around, um, for example, if the original request is uh, justified by the, the practitioner and the protocol includes some views, you know, can the tech basically say it's this part of the protocol that we're following? Personally, I think that's fine. So, the, so for example, you might have a bone scan request and the protocol says you do a bone scan with 400 megabytes of technetium and if there are any hot spots, we need views of X, Y and Z. Okay? That, that's fine. In our trust, we had an issue where the, um, where the techs wanted to then go onto the e-referral system and request those views. And, and I think that at that point, I think they're becoming referrers and we didn't allow that. Okay, so that's, there are some interesting issues with it. Um, and I would say, you know, ask around or ask CQC for perhaps a, a view on that. Okay, so how will you provide all of these different people uh, with information? How do, you, how do you do it? Any, any, any solutions? Training. Uh, okay, so you can give them a training course. That's, that's one possibility. Is that what you do? Yeah. Okay. Any others? Internet. Internet. Uh, we give, you can give them the, info, the, the, the website with Virafer, but that's not everything, is it? You haven't given them the complete uh, information there. You, that's something you can put in. You don't have to print out all the referral guidelines. You can have a web link, for example, to, to iRefer. Okay. Anybody done anything innovative? No? Nobody performed it in song and dance? And, <laughs> no? Okay. <laughs> How often do you provide them with the information? So we do it annually. Okay? Any advance on annually? Everybody's looking at me really, really worried now. Has anybody ever provided information to referrers? Let's have a... Ooh, that's not that many though, is it? That's probably only about a third. So, get on your action plan. Think When you get back to base, think about how you provide information to referrers. Okay. Yeah, sure. What we found in some departments when we've gone around to visit them is they send out an annual letter to their GPs, certainly. And they also use it as a chance to advertise the services that their department offers. So you remind them what the referral criteria are, and oh, by the way, did you know that you can do X, Y, and Z? So it's sort of drumming up more business as well if you decide you've got a new service or something like that. So they use it as a sort of multi purpose yearly update kind of thing. Yeah, I, I would echo that. One of my one of my customers in in the independent sector basically does um, does a referral course for the people in the area, and he finds that his MRI referrals, which has got nothing to do with them, but go through the roof. So he, it's a it's a marketing plan, which is anyway, who'd have thought that? Okay. So uh, so essentially, here's the uh, the legal bit about what referrers what they need to do. Uh, they need to provide sufficient medical data, such as previous diagnostic information or medical records relevant to the exposure, uh, essentially to enable the practitioner to decide whether the exposure is, is justified, whether there's sufficient net benefit. Okay, so a request is legally asking for a clinical opinion. Okay? Now, which group of, which group of people in the hospital don't believe that? <laughs> orthopedics, yeah. <laughs> it's funny how medicine's the same wherever you go, isn't it? Orthopedics. Yeah. Okay. So I tell them, we tell them that the refer has no right to the examination requested. <laughs> Essentially, they're asking you for a favour, and you'll decide whether you're granted. <laughs> <laughs> so when they mess it up, which we know that they do, we've seen the uh, the incident stats. What can you do when things go wrong? Um, you can feed back to the referrer and the team. Okay, so I think that's the, the most basic step. You've got to tell them that they've cocked it up, okay? Because they just don't know. You know, the, these people are requesting all sorts of things, doing all sorts of processes. If you haven't told them that they made a mistake, uh, how are they ever going to know? So, so we, we use our um, incident system for this, okay? We used to just keep a record internally within radiology of how many of these there were, and that's great, but we knew there was a problem anyway. You know that referrers make mistakes. That doesn't change anything. You've got to tell the referrers. 
you can tell their boss. Uh, we certainly had one orthopaedic surgeon, he made four referral errors in one day, okay, which I think is the record. Um, so you've got to tell their boss really that this person, you know, it, it just isn't, isn't, isn't playing ball. You can request that they investigate and that's certainly what we do internally now. We have a root cause analysis process that every referral error gets to do. Okay? So, so the, the team that made the mistake are asked to complete a root cause analysis of why they requested the wrong examination or the wrong patient. Okay? It's relatively simple. Most of them, and I would say about two thirds, are where they didn't get the right patient. Okay? So they guessed from a ward list, they've seen the patient in the corridor and thought that they needed a particular examination and requested it, all of those sorts of things. So on the front of the RCA, there is a few simple questions that essentially teases out, did they identify the patient properly? And if they don't do that, then we make them do the information, the, the ID training and the, the IRMA package again. Basically, we delete their training, make them do it again. How do you think that goes down? <laughs> it's, it's slightly punitive, isn't it? You know, you've got to do the IRMA training again. If you don't do it in a month, we'll take you off the request system. It's up to you. It's a bit like taking their credit card away, isn't it? Can okay. I just ask, are you really asking all medical staff to do that training package? Is that work in your organisation? Yes. Wow. That's yeah. all, I think that sounds great. It's online, it's fine, it's easy. Yeah, 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 yeah. They don't like it, you know, but, and we give them a reasonable period and then we can take them off. You know, we tell them that we'll take them off and the, and the, the compliance with it is really quite high. What about you know, the consultants though, who've been working there, yeah. I mean, as in, they've been working there 20 years or Yes, the, the people, you know, they are the tough group to catch. However, the consultants don't actually refer that many. It's usually the, the more junior doctors that you really need to tackle. And eventually these people will retire at some point anyway. You know. <laughs> Matt, yeah. Matt uh, I just wanted to add, Really, um, doctors have the, um, they have, sorry, brain's going dead. Uh, they must do fire lectures, don't they? They must do yeah. 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 yeah, so uh, mandatory training, thank you so much. So actually, to me, this is actually far more important than some of the mandatory training that they do. So tell them that, that this is part of the mandatory training. Um, how long? How, you know, how long do you think the training package would be for a referrer? How, long, how much do you think they need? So is it two hours? No. no. We do 15 minutes. 15 minutes, okay. Half an hour. To half an hour. Actually, half an hour, personally, I think that's plenty. Do you know what I mean? It's relatively simple, their role, isn't it? You know, what do you actually need to teach them? You know, fill in the request card properly, please. Give us some clinical information only refer things on the referral guidelines. Yeah? ID the patient. Yeah. It doesn't take that long. <clears throat> so keep it simple. It's counterproductive if you give them an hour training package and nobody does it. But if you say, look, it's 10 minutes and you get your e-request in, happy days. They're going to do it, aren't they? Um, remove their requesting rights if they are repeat offenders. We do that. Okay? We just turn them off. Okay? And it's really, really embarrassing for them. You think about it, you've got to ask your mates to do your request because you're incompetent. How bad does that look? Okay, so turn them off. Right, medical exposures procedure. Um, this does not figure anywhere in the legislation. Okay, it doesn't exist. You don't have to do it. However, um, and, and don't worry about the diagram for a, for a minute. It, so it's not an IRMA requirement. It's a really good idea. How many of your <coughs> staff, when you mention Irma, glaze over and think, I can't do that, it's too complicated, right? So this procedure makes Irma more accessible, okay? So if you think about it, it's a simple guide uh, to Irma. It shows how all the processes fit together, okay? And, and a lot of people struggle with that, particularly as they start to work out how it all fits together. They know all the tasks they do that all, all the time, but actually if you show them the flow, it all makes sense. Okay, So, so we, we advocate uh, in, in our uh, advice practice, if you like, that people have this procedure and we give them some suggestions. Okay, If you've got unusual practice, so you might have, I don't know, you might have people on the vans or whatever, 
then your flow diagram is going to change and you might need to reflect that to say at this point it goes off to you know to Alliance or, or in health or whoever um, you know and at that point it's their responsibility and this is when they come back into our system it makes it very very clear to people so a flow diagram uh, is very helpful to uh, to clarify the pathway so I say it covers the parts that Irma doesn't reach okay Right, so uh, <coughs> receiving a request, we haven't really got that far yet, have we? Uh, receiving a request, or chest x-ray please. Who still has chest x-ray please? Anybody? Yeah, it's, it's sort, of, sort of dying out. Uh, we used to get quite a lot. Okay, so um, first thing is admin uh, procedures. Um, really, your, your admin staff need to know what the rules are. And the best way to do that is to write it down in a procedure so that it's very, very clear. Not rocket science, uh, I would advise you to do it. Who has procedures for their admin staff that cover parts of Irma, if you like? Who has that? Okay, one or two. Okay, the rest of you, I'd encourage you to, uh, to think about that. You know, can, if the patient turns up to the reception desk and says, yeah, yeah, this request is for my ankle, but, you know, my hips, oof, it hurts a bit as well, you know. We've had cases where the reception, oh, I'll stick you one of them on as well, we'll do it all right. <laughs> okay. Checking the card for, or the e-requests. E e-requests are great because you, you, you can make the fields mandatory, okay? Um, but making sure that the card and everything is complete, but it's got adequate clinical details. Um, is the referrer entitled to request? Okay. Um, we had an interesting incident which we reported where a dead GP was referring up. I thought that was fantastic. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps he was part of the sixth sense of the side. Um, it turned out there was a translation uh, it, from the GP practice. GPs requested. It always came through as a practice manager through the e-referral system, and we couldn't identify who actually was the referrer. So a dead GP. So when we ran the practice, and you can imagine, can't you? We've got this really inappropriate request from Mr. So-and-so. He said, that's funny, he died three years ago. <laughs> okay. What do you do with poor requests? What do people do? What are your, what are your strategies for dealing with them? Reject them. So you can reject them outright, can't you? Okay. Anybody else do anything different to just rejecting them? So the rejecting <coughs> them, you know, you tear them up, put them in the bin, and ring them and say, it's in the bin. Anybody got any variations on that thing? Okay. So how do you find that works? It works quite well. Okay. Does anybody uh, anybody ring the referrer and then amend the request? Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if the we have a lot of GP requests who are coming on that day, so they haven't got an appointment. Uh, we have a lot of GP requests that are coming on that day, so they haven't got an appointment. You've got a patient in front of you. It's unfair for the patient to send them away. So what we do is ring up the GP and tell them what's wrong with the request, and then get what they want from the, okay. from the request. Okay, so, so for GPs it's really, really difficult, the patient's travelled in, you might not want to just reject it outright, you might want to have a discussion with them. Uh, you might, for example, review the requests as they come in on the e-referral system and actually reject them before the patient comes and ask the GP to say, you know, this, this request was, was inappropriate. There's lots of different ways and it depends on your referral pathway, but you've got to think about it. So we have one hospital that we deal with uh, that essentially... They've got an ED department that's very close to radiology. If they send a poor request, they put a big rejected stamp across the front, right? They send it back with a reason why, and they say, we will not accept the original card, so you will have to write it out again, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, they don't do that very often. There is no point in them writing out a card that they know will be rejected, okay? So think about your strategy for dealing with it, and there are different ways to handle this, but, you know, there's, a, there's always an argument between... Um, you know, making it difficult for the one patient that's standing in front of you and helping all the thousands that come after them and looking after that patient that's, that's there in front of you now. And you, well, you probably get the sense what my view is, but, you know, it, it's, it's not clear cut. But have a think about what your strategy is. The aim is to make the request properly um, because there are risks with poor requests. What do you do if the information doesn't tally? I don't live at that address. Okay. 
you're going to have to ask them, you have to decide how you handle that, and that, I think you need to write that into your procedures. Okay? <coughs> so I've recently moved, okay, that might be reasonable, or I've just got married, or whatever. Okay, we move on to justification. Uh, ICRP, uh, uh, that should say 103, I'm afraid. It's ICRP 103, has three levels of justification for, this is for all radiation use now. So the first is a sort of general level. So radiation is justified for use in medicine as producing net benefit. Okay, so we all know that the x-rays in medicine is, is a good thing, okay, in general. It's the same with nuclear power, you, you might disagree, but there you go. Um, it's justified, perhaps, uh, its use. Uh, radiation in smoke detectors, it's justified, isn't it? It saves lives. The next level is the procedure level. Um, so, for example, are chest x-rays justified for patients with specific symptoms? Okay, so in general, you might say, yes, that's justified. We know that chest x-rays are beneficial. Okay, and then the third level is at the <coughs> patient level. So that's saying, you know, radiation's of benefit to medicine. Okay, no chest x-rays are useful in certain situations. Here's my patient, they have this specific clinical condition. Is it of uh, benefit to those? Okay, so there's three levels that, you, that we need to think about. And really, Irma is concerned with levels two and three. Okay, so just a bit of background there for you. Right, so justification under Irma. No one shall carry out an exposure unless uh, it has been justified by a practitioner. Okay. Justification practitioner as having net benefit to the patient. It's been properly authorised, okay, so whatever your process for doing that is, the authorisation process uh, has been carried out, okay, so it could be a signature, it could be a record on a computer, whatever, whatever that is. Uh, if it's an R&D exposure, it's been approved by a research ethics committee, uh, and if it's medical legal and, and uh, I think the drug smuggling, I think, comes under that. Um, it complies with the employer's uh, procedures. Um, and if the patient may be pregnant, that you've inquired about the pregnancy status. Okay, so that's a bit of regulation. How does a practitioner judge net benefit? Anybody? Is there any practitioners in the room? Put your hands up if you're a practitioner. How do you just how do you judge net benefit? The reason I'm a practitioner is because I've thought and if I'm trying to decide whether what's wrong with the patient and I need further views, then I request further views. Okay, but the, the, the initial view, how do you judge net benefit for the initial? From at the question that the clinician has asked of why they requested the um, image in the first place. Okay, so they give you a clinical reason and you have to decide whether an exposure to a certain amount of radiation will benefit that patient given that clinical condition. Okay, that's, that's what you're doing. Will it, will it help them in, in effect? Okay. So the practitioner judges net benefit by considering the specific objectives of the exposure, okay, and the characteristics uh, of the patient, okay. So examples: you come in with, uh, you know, trauma, okay. You know, it's pretty easy to understand why you might need a CT scan, isn't it? Okay. Right. Any ones that are perhaps a bit? You, you can come up with a grey area one. Where, where does it get a bit, a bit grey? <coughs> screening. Screening, yes. What's the what's the implication of screening? Yes. So basically, the patient could consider that as my risk and probably somebody else's gain. If I'm normal, it, it's sort of somebody else's gain, isn't it? Um, so there are, there are grey areas that, that um, for example, there are NICE guidelines that in our trust we, we've looked at our data to say, well, how many children uh, actually end up with C-spine fractures and need a CT, right? So we looked back through the data and found that we'd only had one case of a C-spine fracture in something like 15 years, okay, and the surgeons didn't do anything about it, they just watched, okay? So actually, do all those children need a CT scan? Because in our practice, there's been no benefit. Right. So that's quite hard, isn't it? Um, 
Anyway, so you have to think about those things. Uh, think about the total benefits both to the patient and society. So the drug smuggling uh, situation is benefit to uh, society, isn't it? The drug smuggler doesn't get a benefit from that x-ray unless you think the drugs are about to burst and whatever. But, uh, you've got to think about the harm to the individual. What is the risk to that particular individual? And that sometimes <laughs> changes. So there's, there are conditions, for example, where um, you know, people are particularly sensitive to radiation and the justification might change in that situation. Okay? The same might apply if, if for example, they're an end-stage oncology patient. The risks are very, very different to, I don't know, uh, let's say it's a young testicular cancer patient that's having a follow-up. Okay? So those, those things tend to vary. So a practitioner has to know what the risk is, don't they? Okay, so that is a requirement. So how do they know what the risk is? They need to know what the dose is, don't they? Okay, so they should have good knowledge of the doses. Uh, you've got to think about alternative techniques of lower dose, so the obvious ones are MRI and ultrasound. Matt, I wonder if I could ask um, if you could say something, if you don't mind, about individual health assessments and the fact that members of the public can in effect turn up at a centre and uh, ask for this IHA, but really it might mean a CT that's not evidence based, etc. Okay, so um, so so the, the questions about this sort of um, I don't know, you've probably heard of the sort of the live scan style issue, where you can turn up and have your your MOT. Um, and the issue about that is, well, you know, we know what the risks are from those CTs. Uh, you know, but, but what is the benefit? And I think there are certain cases where the benefits perhaps stack up. So that, that applies to any screening. In effect, it's screening, isn't it? So, you know, mammography, we're all comfortable with that. Well, well I'm I don't know. But <laughs> I, I don't really know, but anyway. <laughs> we're comfortable with the technique existing. <laughs> you know, but, the, but, you know, whole body CTs just to find out whether, you, whether you're, um, you know, whether you have any particular risk factors. Um, so, so really, the, the, the judgment comes down on, on can you show that there is a benefit from these particular techniques. So, for example, lung cancer screening, I think the benefits now are probably, uh, you know, actually clear, and it's something that should happen. It's not, it's not happening because of funding reasons. Whole body CT is probably not that, you know, that useful. Cardiac, well, if you've got certain risk factors, then I think it's starting to come out that perhaps there might be a benefit in those cases. Okay, so that's that's how they actually. You know, consider it, and and it, and it's a complicated question. It's not straightforward. Okay, uh, exposure us on medical legal grounds. Why is that a, an issue? Why would we be worried about that? Uh, they might not be a symptomatic patient. The reason is that the patient doesn't actually get any medical benefit from the exposure. All they get is a, you know, no window fee cash, <laughs> cash lump sum. Okay. Uh, you have to think about exposures that have no direct benefit, health benefit to the individual. Uh, the urgency exposure um, when involving women who pregnancy cannot be excluded. Okay, so sometimes it is an urgent situation. You might, you might think about that. Um, what sort of things would they consider? You know, you're considering the risks of not having the exposure, aren't you? That's that's really what they're doing. Uh, breastfeeding women undergoing nuclear medicine procedures. Why is that an issue? Breast yeah. So radioactive breast milk. Okay. So justification. Um, we mentioned about the uh, the guidance on on much greater than intended. The physicists uh, have changed the title of the document because the guidance has been so long. They call it <laughs> much later than expected guidance. <laughs> okay. So so we've been waiting ages for that. So I'm going to go back to the, uh, the, the Shakespearean guide to uh, justification. So this is Hamlet's Guide to Irma, to justify or not to justify, but what is the clinical question? And that's obviously, you know, basically that's not very clear, is it? So justification is a cerebral process. Basically, you, you think about it, okay? You've got to think about, is this justified or not? And I would say recording is authorization. So you think about it, and that's the justification. Yes, I think I'm going to do this. Authorization is, and I'm going to sign a bit of paper, say yes on the computer, whatever you do. So, authorised, authorisation, authorised personnel only. In effect, the act of recording that justification uh, has taken place uh, can only be done by operators entitled to do so. So, for plain film, you may say, all oh, your radio officers can do this, that's fine. 
you may say for, I don't know, CT for stroke, it's, it's a named group of people, you might restrict it in certain cases. <coughs> but, but basically you, there needs to be an entitlement to do this. So if the practitioner isn't present, you're going to need some uh, authorization guidelines. Okay. So, authorization guidelines, formally issued by a practitioner. And it should say in brackets, also written by the radiographer and just signed up by the practitioner. <laughs> That's what happens, we know that. Okay. So who is a practitioner in your centre? Okay. Do you know who, who they all are? So let's pick on somebody from that table. Who's the practitioners in your centre? All radiologists are. All radiologists? Okay, what about the registrars? No, they're not named on the panel. Okay, so do the radiographers, if the, radio, if the registrars are not on the list, do the radiographers take a card to a registrar and say, can I do this? Yes. Okay, so what is the registrar acting as? They're the delegated responsibility from the registrar. Oh, they are acting as the practitioner, but they're delegated. So it's a binary question, are they a practitioner or are they not? Yes. They are a practitioner. So are they listed in your list of practitioners? They rotate through, so they're not, no. Okay, so you've got an issue there, haven't you? So you, you, know, you need to know who are your practitioners, and you can't ask a registrar who's not on the list to behave as a practitioner. Okay? So think about who are your practitioners, and then think about what do the radiographers actually do, and check that process out. Okay, so who's practitioner for nukes? Uh, sorry, I just I like making jokes about nuclear medicine. I don't know why. <laughs> Unclean medicine, yeah. Uh, okay, so it's uh, the ARZAC holder always. Um, the guidelines are often based on I refer, but you're going to need additional <coughs> details for your particular <coughs> specials or local practice. Okay, so you've got to think about uh, you know those specific referral pathways that are special to you. Um, you need to be able to identify the name of the individual practitioner. Okay. So my, the test that I do is to take a random exposure and say, show me which practitioner justified this. And they say, ah, oh, yes, but we have 35 radiologists and they're all the practitioner. No, that won't. I need to know the name. Okay. So you could say, well, all right, we have, uh, you know, Mr. Arvark. Right, he does Mondays, that's fine, because it's by procedure, isn't it? Okay, Mr. Chumley Warner's Tuesdays, that's fine, you can do that as well. Or you can say, it's one that takes responsibility for all the plain film, and it's always them. Okay? Or, you can have the CT situation, where quite often they will record that they were the practitioner on the, the wrist system, or on, by signing the card. Okay? So I need to know, for every single exposure, who was the practitioner. So you can show me your procedures, or you can show me your record. Okay, so you need to be able to do that. Okay, uh, the authorization the guidelines need to be available to operators and reviewed periodically. Uh, I went to one site <coughs> and um, I picked up a random card, and I'm really good at picking up random cards because they're always the ones that show the problems. And it said chest x-ray for uh, basically query infection. Okay, who would do a chest x-ray for query infection? Is that, is that in your authorization guidelines? Yes. yes. Okay, so, so I said to the radiographer, uh, show me your authorization guidelines where it says you can do that. Okay, so they thumb through the page and think, it's got to be in there, it's pretty obvious, we do loads of these. They haven't got it written down at all. So, what does that tell you? It tells you that they haven't been reviewed, but it tells you something far more important than that. It tells you that the radiographers are not referring to them. Okay? They're not looking at them, and that's really, really important. Okay, they need to be following them. Okay, so if they are in the cupboard, on the shelves, whatever, that's an issue. Uh, what about I mentioned registrars? What do you do in intervention? What's your process? And you're going to think about this in a little while. What about additional views in CT? How does that work? Okay, so can you do them or not? Can you go on and do that <coughs> contrast view? Can you go on and do that <coughs> extra if you see something? You know what? What is your process? What about out of hours? Is there a, a radiologist or a practitioner that you can ask? What about in theatres? Okay, you've got to think about these things, and, and the test to do is to take each process in your department and follow it through and say, can I find the practitioner and the authorization guideline that permitted this exposure? Okay, and and 
I've not found a department yet where you can't catch somebody out on that. Okay? There'll be an area that you haven't thought of. Right, here's the authorization flow diagram. So you get the clinical information, uh, you review it, and you compare it with the authorization guidelines. I mean, you, you know, if you know them and it's, it's something that's very, very common, you can do that in your head, that's fine. Uh, you're going to check for previous imaging, if it matches the guidelines, and you know, there is some scope for professional judgment. You might have to convert the clinical terms, okay? It doesn't have to be written in exact words that they use, that's fine, but that condition has to be listed or that, that, um, that particular scenario. And if it matches, you may proceed with the exposure, that's fine. If it doesn't match, you've got a choice of, of, of approach, really. You can go back to the referrer and say, I need a little bit, this isn't, this isn't in the guidelines, I need some more information, can you tell me some more? And then you go round the loop again, say, now with the new information, does it pass? You could reject it with a reason. Uh, so, for example, uh, coccyx views, you know, we just don't do these. It doesn't matter what you've got on the card, you're not getting one. Okay? You may take it to a practitioner, okay? And a lot of people take it to a registrar and think they're following the practitioner process, but actually uh, they're not. The registrar often is just an operator, and they should be using authorization guidelines. Okay? And if they do that, I say, well, where are they? I say, ah, yeah. They're quite clever people, you know, these registrars. But we didn't write it down. Okay, and this one is crossed out. Just do it anyway. You'd be surprised how often people do that. Okay? Right, the pregnancy question. Of course, it's all sorts of fun. So... It applies to female patients of childbearing age, 12 to 55, or beyond if appropriate. And the best thing I've seen now is asking the, um, uh, asking, uh, the relevant department in your hospital, have you got any data on you know, ages where, where um, people are getting pregnant? They will have that data, do you know what I mean? So you, you may find that in your area that's not appropriate and you can change it to go, I would suggest, only beyond that. Um, Exposures below the diaphragm uh, or above the knee, or don't worry about it. Okay? People think they're doing a good job by asking people if they've got a foot, you know, having a foot x-ray, are oh, you pregnant? No, you're not doing a good job. Okay? You're wasting time, you're asking questions that are unnecessary, so just don't do it. Okay? Um, this is obvious, do it before the exposure. Okay? <laughs> right? <laughs> now, we had, we had a mammography service where um, I, I was uh, reviewing the uh, procedures and I said to the radio office, you know, how does the radiologist, um, you know, have you got any authorization guidelines? They said, no, 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 the radiologist does it. I said, okay, all right, right, well, you're really lucky, they're here all day then. They said, no, 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 they come at the end of the day and do them all. <laughs> I said, but, but it's too late then? They went, oh yeah. You know, mammography, really? Okay, so who is responsible? I would suggest the clear, it's not a legal requirement, but the clearest thing is to say the operator making the exposure We'll, do, we'll make sure that this check has been carried out, because that is without doubt, it's clear, isn't it? If you press the button, there's only one, I mean, it'd be quite hard to jointly press the button, wouldn't it? Nobody does that. It's the operator making the exposure. The question you ask first is, are you or could you be pregnant? Okay, not the LMP question. Okay? And then you split the responses pretty much into, into four groups. Okay, there is this document, uh, I'm I think you'll get the slides afterwards by hook or by crook. There is a document that, that explains all of this in great detail. Right, so if the patient's likely to be pregnant, or actually is pregnant, then you would treat as pregnant. Okay, so uh, you've got to think about justification and consent. Okay, we're now doing this to you and you're pregnant, you're going to have to consent them for that, for the pregnancy element as well, perhaps. Uh, you'd minimise the exposure to the foetus where possible. Um, if you can do that, why don't you do it all the time? That's another question. Um, if there's no possibility of pregnancy, uh, you may need a, a form, get them to sign, so you scan it in, keep a record, certainly. Okay, you need a record of that. And I probably be involved in three cases where, down the line, the patient says, but you didn't ask the pregnancy question, and then we just trot out with a nice form showing that they've signed. Okay, that... that legal case, and it did come from solicitors, goes away at that point. The solicitor says, there's no realistic chance. They've got evidence that you said no. Um, then you split into the, whole, the high and low dose. So if pregnancy can't be excluded, it's low dose. 
use the 28 day or miss period rule depending on what people call it, it's the same process okay uh, and if pregnancy can't be excluded uh, and it's a high dose we use a 10 day rule okay you need to define your high dose procedures and what I always recommend to people is to say it's all a fluoroscopy except these things okay because then you're covered aren't you okay there is no falling in between the crack this wasn't listed as high dose and it wasn't listed as low dose so between didn't know what to do. List them all, or um, you know, have a catch-all statement that says, unless it's defined as low dose, it's high. Okay. Issues with this pregnancy test. When are they, when are they to be used? When are the tests effective? Okay. So if you do a pregnancy test, but the test you used isn't sensitive at that particular stage, what use is it? It'll tell you no, but the patient's pregnant. So you've got to think about that. Don't make up your pregnancy process when the patient's in ED. Do you know what I mean? And nobody can decide what to do. Think about it first. Who can justify? I would say not the referrer. So who still has the ignore the pregnancy question box in their, uh, their requests? Anybody still have that? Does it have any significance? What does it mean? Does it mean that, you, that the practitioner doesn't have to take that into consideration? I would say, you know, you could perhaps take that, you could take that away because really the practitioner decides whether it's justified or not. Okay. Uh, if you're going to delay the examination, you need to inform the referrer. You can't just leave them hanging. Uh, so don't ask the LMP date first. Uh, what if it's less than 28 days, uh, but uh, they're actively trying uh, to conceive? Okay. Uh, trauma. The practitioner, and they do in our case, may justify all procedures. They say if the patient's you know, under the trauma pathway, we don't worry about it. Just get on with it. Do you know what I mean? Because the risks, the risks of not doing the examination are far higher. But you know that's up to you, that's up to your practitioners. Uh, special people with special needs. How do you obtain the information? You've got to think about that as well. What do you do for theatres and unconscious? So, um, so we've had the situation where um, the radiographer's put in the awful situation that, that they've gone to theatre. The patient's been opened up. Nobody's asked the pregnancy question. What do you do? Right. It, you know, the risk of not finishing that operation is quite high, isn't it? So my advice is always, you finish the procedure and then you raise an incident uh, essentially to say that the pregnancy process wasn't fucked. That's probably the pragmatic way to deal with that. And we do that for every single one. Okay? Matt, can I just ask a quick question? <clears throat> what are people's views on um, paediatrics um, that come along for an examination and they're accompanied by a parent or guardian? Sorry, Sue. Sorry. Um, so the question was, if you have a paediatric patient who comes to the department who is um, with a garden, guardian or parent, and um, they're obviously, they fit the criteria between 12 and 55, what's your views on who do you ask? Do you ask the patient? Do you ask the mother or father that's with the patient? It's a very sensitive area. I just wondered if we could get a, maybe a little thought process going on about how you, how you handle that. Well, yeah, ask the mother. Ask the mother. Ask the mother whether um, the child has started, period, uh, and take it from there, really. Um, it can be difficult. Actually, uh, I would debate as well, 12, they're, they're 10 years of age and having periods now. So, uh, you know, you've got, got to be very, very careful. Yeah, so I'd rather ask than have a problem. Yeah. I, I mean, I think for us as well, it's a... It's a, it's a sorry. <laughs> Um, is that a patient who doesn't tell their parents that they're sexually active at that age isn't going to admit to their mother or father in the middle of an x-ray room that they could be pregnant so that's a real that's a, a big grey area I think around that and that's something that I think locally everybody should, should think about I don't think there is a definitive answer out there but it's, it's unlikely that you will get the correct answer or the, the honest opinion or the honest answer from the, from the patient if they haven't even told their parents they have a partner. So. I mean, the thing that I would say with all of these processes, you can never stop 100% of pregnant patients you know, making it through. And that's, that's not going to happen. The idea is to make sure that you're minimising the risk to a sensible level. Because some people are going to lie to you. Some people, you know, it's, it's going to be confusing for them. Do you know what I mean? The idea is to trap as many as you realistically can, okay? So think about that policy. Okay, ID question. Uh, 
um, part of a six-point check. The six-point bit isn't a legal requirement, but it's it's um, it, practice basically is evolving into this six-point check, uh, which I think is a great thing. Um, so you want a minimum of three independent identifiers. Now, when you go to most trusts, they have an ID policy, and it always says two. They say, ha ha ha! Well, you're going to have to change it because Mr. Cliff will come and tell you that you've got to have three. Okay. Um, if you want some support with your three identifiers, and it's not usually the radiographers that object, it's the people filling in the requests that object to three, so I can't be bothered to write a third. Um, go and find your comrades in this cause, right? The transfusion people, they like lots of identifiers, because when they give people the wrong blood, they tend to get a bit ill. Um, the other people are, this, are the sort of um, the WHO checklist surgical types. They are, they're, they're, they're your comrades in the three identifiers. Um, cause. Most people use it now, it, it's not really a big problem. It's an active process, uh, fully completed in the room, okay? Not Mr. Blocks, please come in for your chest x-ray, okay? That still happens, it's not very common. Uh, it's interesting, the, um, you know, in, in the CT case, you know, you, <coughs> it looks like the HCPC say, if you don't do it, you are not fit to practice. Okay, interesting judgment. The rest of the case is quite interesting. I'll have a read of that. But um, you know, so that's that's the uh, the question that I ask of the managers when they find that a radiographer hasn't carried out the ID process. Have you thought about referring them to HCPC? And they all go, "Ooh, that's a bit nasty." Well, you know. Okay, so what's your name, date of birth, etc.? You've all got your um, your questions. Uh, not are you Mr. Blogs? People will say anything to get their X-ray quick and go home. Okay. But the best, <laughs> the best one I heard was um, there, there was a, a, a relative brought uh, one of their family for um, a barium enema. You see, so they sat them out outside the, the barium enema room, and the patient went to the toilet, and the radio was in a bit of a rush, came out, brought them in, and the poor relative got on the table, and they had a barium enema, right? <laughs> And you can imagine on the way home, say, well, that wasn't what I expected. <laughs> okay, so you must define who checks uh, and when, okay? Who's going to do it? When are they going to do it? Write it down. So the person pressing the button, making the exposure, must ensure this has done, been done before the exposure. We've had a case that was involved with, uh, with, um, with uh, as an interventional procedure, some sort of dilatation and the patient managed to get all the way from the ward, all the way through radiology, onto the table, and they were entirely the wrong person, and not a single person had identified them. The radiologist says, well, I thought the radiographer identified everybody. The radiographer says, well, I thought it was you, because you were the one that was, you know, you were pressing the button. Do you know what I mean? You need to sort out those confusions, make it sure it's very, very clear. Okay. Contingencies for hearing uh, and uh, hearing difficulties. Um, <coughs> The way, the way I explain this to people is, if you ask the three active questions and the patient gives you the right answers, right, you don't need to use the contingencies. Okay? If they can't do that, you've got to follow your contingency procedure. So it's quite easy. You ask the three questions, if they can't do it, look at your contingency plan. Is that pretty clear? So unconscious patients, theatres, you need to consider that. Language issues. Uh, Age, so paediatrics, again, if you ask the kid those three questions and they can give you an answer, it's probably the right kid. Okay, uh, any other communication issues? Uh, you need to think about when the demographics on your CRIS system is wrong. What are you going to do about that? What is the process? How do you make sure that you're not just, um, you know, not just correcting the data to suit what you've got in front of you? Okay, so there was a certain independent sector organisation where the patient came up and they said, uh, ah, well, we check uh, the, the, uh, the demographic data with our billing system. So, all oh, right, okay. So, how does the billing system get the information? So, well, when they turn up with a card, we ask them their details, okay? So, they ask them their name, their date of birth, and their address, and then they check it. And you say, hang on a minute, well, that's bound to be right, isn't it? Because you've just asked them what it is. How could that be an active process? And then the penny drops that that, that isn't robust, you know. The referrer needs to give you that information, and then you check it with the patient. So, so have a think about that. So what happens when the data's wrong? What are you going to do about it? The obvious ones are married name and changes of address, but there are others. 
Okay. Um, do not rely on ID bands. They contain errors. There was a publication out that said, I think it was something like 30% of all ID bands have at least one error. Okay. So that doesn't mean you don't need to check the ID band. Okay, you do the ID process and then check the ID band. That is the robust way to do it. Okay, so people think, well, if you tell me the ID band's error, got errors in it, why would I bother checking? It's a check that everybody knows that this is the right patient. So ask the questions first, then check the ID band. Um, in our trust, inpatients uh, and ED patients should have one. Okay, that is what our trust policy says. If that's the case, and ED don't put one on. What are you going to do? We send them back to ED to get the band put on. Okay? If they don't like that, ask them to lobby to change the trust policy. Stick to your, you know, once you've got your procedures written down, make sure they're followed. Okay? You can review them if it's not working, but stick to your, stick to your procedures. Right, vetting. Okay? Vetting, this is a nice one. I like this one. So, uh, if anybody in, in my radiology department talks about vetting in any procedure, they have to put a quid in the swear box, right? Betting is swearing, okay? And I'll explain why. You all think about betting. I know you think about betting. So, what I would suggest is do a word check on your Irma system, your procedures, for the word vetting, okay? When vetting appears, get the, uh, you know, the little thing in the spell check and what have you where you can replace with, right? Justification. All right, we're going to change it to either justification, authorization, or protocoling. Right? And the reason is that vetting means different things to different people. And you think, oh, well, well, I know what vetting means. Okay, so you ask a radiologist for what vetting means, and they tell you. And then you go along to a radiologist, and they say something entirely different. Okay, in the same organisation. Then you go to the reception staff and say, oh yeah, we vet all the requests to make sure they're fine before we book the patients. Okay, it is ambiguous. Okay. So make sure you've thought about what it is that different people are doing. And people seem to be quite wedded to this term, uh, so I've asked them to take it out. Don't use betting, you know, describe what you actually do, okay? So, betting is often vague and ambiguous, and I'm told by the inspectors that they will ask for clarification on what it means. Okay, so uh, this is uh, our version of uh, the pause and check. Um, so, if you're in the airline industry, right, you, you've probably all seen the pilots do their pre-flight checklist, don't they? Okay, and it's on a laminated card, right, that you can't sign because they don't sign them, right? So in the in the hospitals, there's always a, a temptation to have a checklist and you have to sign it. So if you do the WHO checklist, do you sign it, right? In the airline industry, the pilots don't sign checklists. Might surprise you. Anybody know why? So this, yeah, you know, I like that one. That's a good one. So they got the hands to operate the plane. No, no, no. Fair enough. The reason is that pilots follow checklists. Right? Think about it. Why do pilots follow checklists? Because they don't want to hit the ground like a dart. Okay, so the point is that with pilots, they follow it because they're convinced of the, the, the necessary safety uh, process to go through. Okay, so the airlines convince the pilots why using the checklist is a good idea. So I would suggest that's the message you want to get across when you use a pause and check. You don't have to sign in triplicate every little part to say that you've done it, right? Make sure it's so routine that you do this. You know, whatever your process is, do it all the time and explain why that you will make an error if you don't use it. And it's part of um, that there is a, a sort of radiation protection culture initiative trying to explain to people, instead of saying, look, this is just the rules, you just follow it, to say, actually, you should do this because it's a good thing to do, it will prevent errors, it will improve clinical care. Okay? So, um, so I, I would advocate something uh, of this nature and get them laminated stuff uh, up around the department. Um, the bit that I haven't covered is about exposures. I'm sure you all know you need exposure charts and uh, you know, they need to be written down and they need to be appropriate, so I'm not going to go through that. Um, and I'm sensing now that you do uh, some sort of break. Okay. So what we're going to do 
is um, have an exercise where you think about your, uh, your ERMA pathway from referral through to making the exposure. Okay, so what I want you to do is to have a think about a specific pathway. Okay, so some of you might think about lethal medicine, some of you might think about DEXA, some of you might think about mammography, some of you might think about, um, I don't know, theatres, and I want you to think about all the things that I've talked about and think about the issues relating to your pathway, how it might differ and perhaps how you're going to tackle that. Okay?